That's my dog. That's my dog. Body that I'd rather share my dialogue. That's my dog. That's my dog. Should we just sit here and stare at our phones for 30 minutes? I was just turning mine on silent after seeing it. Am I disgusted about how many views Despacito has? That's, that, that is a new tune? No, it's not new, but it, like I've never, I'd heard it maybe twice. Who, who is the artist? I don't even know. Okay. It's like Justin Bieber or something. Oh. It's like five billion. Are you a believer? I can't say, I can't, I can't say I am. I wonder if Bob Blah Blah is a believer. I think, he, yeah, I think I did you see him. You know who Bob Blah Blah is? I saw his blog. <laughs> yeah, he did have a, the Bob blah blah yeah, blah blah. Yeah. Did you see that? No. It's from Arrested Development. Oh, is that a thing? I yeah, I the guy's name is Bob. He's a lawyer, and his name is Bob blah blah. Oh. Uh, Bob blah blah, and he's got a law blog. <laughs> I'm not. I, I, uh, I think I might have watched that show once. Okay. With you. Oh, guys, what's up? We're here. We're just trying to muster our way through the evening. We yeah. had a long weekend. Yeah. It has and been uh, a long one. we're both kind of wiped out, but we're mm-hmm. dying. Or we're yes, we are dying, but we're diehards mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And we decided to come Won't here today. Won't that stop us? No, we're gonna we're gonna be here today talking about socialization mm-hmm. and that stuff. Um, but first, I'd like to give a uh, thank you to our sponsors. Next. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> All right. No, seriously, a uh, couple new dog food recalls. OC d- raw dog recalls dog food due to listeria, which is some super scary stuff. OC raw dog. So their food and their treats. Uh, I'm not sure if the treats were also with listeria, but it's some super bad stuff that's got a crazy mortality rate. Yeah. So if you guys are feeding OC raw dog food, Stop. Doing Stop. That. <laughs> Figure out if you're if you got a recall because that's that stuff sounds. Or bad. romaine lettuce for humans. Yeah, what's salmonella? Yeah, big deal. Mm-hmm. A lot of it. That. I heard that. Yeah, kind of I told across, you across the board. Yeah, you did tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope you've heard. You I was just it. trying to yeah. substantiate your claim, man. Yeah. You know? Anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, socialization is, I think, the biggest misconception in all of dog rearing and dog raising. And, it, you know, of course, this is my opinion, and my opinion is what it is. But uh, it's from observation and the problems that I've dealt with here at the kennel and working and stuff. And um, so I thought it'd be cool if I kind of give you my take, and then you just, and then you can maybe answer some questions for me about social effects on the on the individual. Yeah, I'll try. I'll certainly try to. Essentially, it's going to be like a nature versus nurture thing almost on your end. It's hard to kind of get away from from that as the core of a lot of the questions that we, I think, that we discuss. I think at the end of the day, it's the core of everything we're doing here. Right. And it's just like little offshoots of that. Whether right. when, you're trying you're to like de- build drive or you're mm-hmm. trying to suppress an idea or when, whatever. When you're dealing with two species that are interacting in the same environment, you the question is always at the core is what is... What is reigning supreme here? Is it nature or is it nurture? Mm-hmm. Because we're in the same nature. Mm-hmm. Or we're in the same nurture, but we are of a different nature. So oh, I see. If what I had talking. a dog sitting in this room with me, we'd be in the same environment experiencing the same stimuli, but we'd end up very differently. So, yeah. yeah. And then the individual, <clears throat> how they're right. reacting to things, I guess right. you could say simply. Um, well, my, my thing on socialization is I think it's about experience not interaction. And uh, a really great resource for this is actually um, Learberg, who uh, also is like a kind of a dog training media mogul. If you guys haven't seen him, it's Learberg.com, L-E-E-R-B-U-R-G. I also have a lot of materials with them that you guys, that are available for purchase. If you Streaming, and they ship very quickly. Yeah. Cheap shipping. Yeah, yeah. It's a really great, uh, we know the people, and it's mm-hmm. a great organization, great company. Uh, but they work heavily with Mike Ellis, mm-hmm. who's an awesome dog trainer, but really, uh, he's an incredible dog trainer, but it's <clears throat> what can overshadow that is his ability to explain things, and he's got a great video out on YouTube about how he socializes his dog, and it's real black and white, and it's, it's, it's very nice, it's something you guys can check out, but he's essentially saying the same thing. I don't really want my dog to interact with anybody or anything that I don't know or that I can't control. Mm-hmm. Because I can't, if I can't control the outcome, 
I, uh, it's too risky for me, roll, essentially. Roll the dice. Yep, yeah. yep. So I don't uh, allow my dog to interact with strange dogs. I don't allow my dog to interact with strange people. I don't let people pet my dog. Uh, I, I try to keep the... And, and what I'm trying to create is social neutrality, where the dog just doesn't care. And I've done this over and over and over again with several dogs and a lot of puppies and stuff. And it really does work. And basically, my approach is to just go in, socialize, yes, is bring the dog as many places as possible, as you can, you know, give them as many experiences as they can have, experiences as they can have, but uh, controlled experiences mm -hmm. and have everything make sense. Like, you know, they can start by doing this and then gradually you can increase the level of stimulus that you're exposing the dog to, whatever. But the whole time, the dog does not get to interact and if the dog does interact with anything, it's me in that situation. So with the puppy I have now, I took him to the pet store, I took him to the vet, I took him to anywhere I took him when he was young and when I was able to, I would bring him in the room, hang out for a minute, he'd look at me, I'd click, give him a piece of food, and now we're training. Mm -hmm. So his idea now when I go to the vet is he you know, looks at me or pushes between my legs or does something thinking that we're going to train, but he's pretty oblivious to other people if he's in the idea that we're training for the most part. And that's what I try to achieve across the board, just generally. And I feel that uh, if I do that, I create this socially neutral dog who is very safe, ultimately, and non-reactive to all these different stimulus that we have socially, because dogs are integrated into every form of our social life, you know, in every way. From taking them for walks in the neighborhood, to being able to sit outside at the coffee shop and have coffee with them and stuff like that. Uh, but for some reason, people here think that the opposite. They think that the more dogs your dog can meet, the better off it is. The more children your dog can meet, the better off it is. Seniors, dis you know, disabled people, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, uh, they don't think about just the experience. They think about the actual interaction, and I think that's when things go awry for the most part. And, um, you know, the dog will like it or it won't like it. And if it likes it, it's going to start to seek it and then potentially demand it. And that manifests itself into leash pulling and whining and barking, mm -hmm. lunging, stuff like that, even if it's out of excitability. I got a dog right now, Buddy, man, that's just giving me a run for my money who's got the same thing going on. E even though by nature the dog is not dog aggressive, but he's extremely leash aggressive in these situations because of you know, experiences. We kind of talked about this last time. Actually, I got to throw something in from our last talk. You mentioned something and I, I commented and I was not clear with my comment and it could easily be construed not the way I want it to be, which was we were talking about how people are dealing with trauma and you were talking about mm -hmm. the, the eye movement deal mm -hmm. in the sensors. And I said, we don't have anything with dogs. We only have correction. And I was really thinking, you can't correct an insecure dog. Who's in right. You know, that's completely inappropriate. But if I was thinking in terms of like human aggression and dog aggression and how this stuff manifests. Or correction that. of behavior that exists yeah. in, in a comparable way for dogs. as Appropriate for the dog. Right, right. right. Yeah. But yeah. comparable to humans because humans yeah. have a multitude of ways of handling issues such as therapy, such as specific forms of therapy, such as ways to, to influence the boundaries that exist for a human and correction happens to be the most prominent way to establish boundaries for a dog. So that's yeah. where I thought you were going with it. And hopefully the audience kind of... I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, you know, at some point we'll be able to hire an editor. <laughs> can go ahead and just say, Mark, did you really just say that? Anyway, um, so back to social... Thank you for helping me with that. Back to social stuff. I just feel like if we have the socially neutral dog who can accept all these things and not act upon them, we have true social behavior which is us respecting other people's spaces. You know, I mean, I can't go up and touch anybody I want. I can't get too close to someone. You can, but you really shouldn't. It, yeah, I mean, it's, it's... very frowned upon. Yeah, and it's also really uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, and like, I always tell people if I see you in the grocery store and I don't know you and, I, and you're looking at the oranges and I come up and stand an inch from your face and go, man, those are some nice oranges. You're going to be weirded out then. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but what you're dealing with, you know, and you're, you're, you're uh, stuff... Mm -hmm industry is like you know dealing with humans right. mostly so i think that social things have a pretty dramatic effect on humans as well so mm -hmm. if i was say uh raised where you're from new york mm -hmm. i'm from rural minnesota mm -hmm. so we have different approaches to social things maybe i'm not as comfortable around so many people something like that you know so so your social environment has a dramatic effect on your overall character and, and uh, the way you respond to things.
Can you talk about that a little bit? Give me some. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there really isn't anything that doesn't have a drastic effect on an individual's character or, or who they are in that moment, um, whether it be a compilation of experiences or their upbringing or where they were raised or a traumatic memory from when they were six and, the, you know, something happened at the candy store, whatever it may be. Um, and when it comes to humans, just as when, as when it comes to dogs, and I didn't draw this out enough last week but there are varying levels of resiliency mm. that exist within each individual and we in the human research world we haven't been able to ter- determine why some people are more resilient to certain things than others so your ability to bounce back or your ability to adapt mm-hmm. after having certain experiences determines how resilient you are and just have they looked in way in what ways have they tried to measure that i'm just curious well there are people that experience varying levels of similar traumas Mm -hmm. some that are completely fine and some that are absolutely affected by it more deeply than you could even imagine for the rest of their lives Mm -hmm. they're big t traumas and they're little t traumas Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. which is the spectrum of traumatic events so i get to the store and my favorite type of sumo oranges are sold out for me, that's a little traumatic, but that's a very small T or versus somebody that has uh, been in active combat and has seen, you know, horrid, yeah. gruesome things. That's a big T trauma, sexual yeah. assault, yeah. Um, things along those childhood abuse, things along those lines. Um, but you can have two siblings from the same family that were both exposed to the same forms of abuse and the same forms of things as they were growing up. And one ends up with severe, you know, mental, I don't want to say issues, but mental kind of uh, things that are holding them back from, from their full potential versus the other sibling who is just fine. Hmm. Almost like puppies when you have Very puppies much in the so same like litter. Puppies. Right. So, so varying levels of resiliency and we haven't been able to pick out in the brain that this chromosome or this synapse or, you know, this is exactly what determines an individual's level of resiliency. But when it comes to being social, right? And this is where kind of my sociology passion really comes about, which Mm -hmm. above psychology and above all else is, is my true passion, Mm -hmm. um, is, is sociology and why pieces of the puzzle fit together the way that they do. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what being social means for a human, it's partaking in society, Mm -hmm. right? In, in in some way, shape or form. And Mm -hmm. humans have a, a, need as a species to interact Mm -hmm. and to form relationships and to bond Mm -hmm. when you're growing up you're immediately exposed to school which is a way to learn from others Mm -hmm. which is a way to develop language which is a way to you know for your brain to cognitively develop in ways that it wouldn't be able to if you were never interacted with Mm -hmm. and then later on in life as you get into kind of your teenage years and past some people become introverts some people become extroverts some people become you know, their preference is to be introverted, but in a given situation, they can be extroverted. And just so many different aspects and relationships dealing with being social can exist. And it really becomes more of a choice for a grown individual. Hmm. In the dog world, dogs don't have much of a choice about how social they can be because it should be controlled by a handler mm-hmm. or by an owner. Mm-hmm. And I've never met an introverted dog who's like i prefer to be by myself Mm -hmm. but i have met a ton of dogs that give physical indicators that i don't want to be in this situation right Mm -hmm. now Mm -hmm. and when they're forced to it can have terrible effects Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know like the scared insecure dogs Mm -hmm. and i've seen dogs that are not oh i recharge my soul battery by being around other dogs and sharing my experiences but we do see dogs that are excitable to the point where they have to go see that other dog Mm -hmm. and interact with it and that can be very detrimental Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't talk to dogs um, as many as they claim can whisper to them. That's just not true. Um, But I think a lot of people take what it means to be social for a human and directly translate that to what it means for a dog. And that's been my main opposition with the word social applied to the dog world. Because being social doesn't mean hanging out at the barbecue tossing the football with Bucky Mm -hmm. and he goes up and says hello to everybody, tells everybody a funny joke, fills them in on what he's been doing at work that week Mm -hmm. and says hello to everybody. For Fido to be social, it just means to be a part of Mm -hmm. 
sitting there mm-hmm. calmly, mm-hmm. that's fine. Mm-hmm. If the dog wants a little bit more engagement, let him run around. But it doesn't mean up in everybody's face, and it doesn't mean he's the star of the party. Mm-hmm. Oh, that Jim Bob, he's so social, he goes out every Friday night and gets mm-hmm. wasted, and he's you want to have a good time, go out with him. Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, you want to go talk to Fido, because Fido's going to throw a bang and barbecue. <laughs> you know, it's just <clears throat> social means something different for dogs. And being a part of kind of the dog world, but not professionally, the number one thing that I hear when something is behaviorally wrong with a dog is, you got to socialize him more. Yeah, or he you needs didn't. To be, or you didn't socialize him enough, or yeah, her yeah. enough. Yeah. And you nobody know, tells you like how to do that. They just say go socialize. He needs to be more socialized. Yeah. And nobody yeah. tells you that. When I was a kid, the reason that I'm such a weird introvert is because I wasn't socialized enough as a kid. It's like I did all that shit when <laughs> I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I still prefer to be on my own, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. just who I am, and mm-hmm. just how I am. Mm-hmm. Um, So when you get a dog that expresses, I don't want to be pet by every stranger, it's not, that's just how he is. It's, you didn't do something right raising him. Exactly. And that's my main problem when when I hear people say that Mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes into your nature. Some dogs, you know, when I had a few litters of puppies, and within every litter you'd see see the whole spectrum right Mm -hmm. there. That's kind of the beautiful thing. Isn't and we it? can talk about that when we talk about picking a puppy. Picking a puppy, yeah, right. or picking a breeder and mm-hmm. stuff. You can see, you can really see the whole spectrum there. And then there's puppy aptitude tests and stuff like that, which are very cool. Um, but it's really interesting because what you said, like two, like a, two siblings from the same mm-hmm. genetics and the same environment raise the same, react differently, much in the same way that two puppies from the same exact litter will react differently. And you and the cool thing about it is if you if you line them up according to like a character graph, you'll see the most dominant going down to the most submissive and mm-hmm. just right down the pike, you know, like this one, this one, this one, this one and it's just like and I think I think it was someone told me once, some smart breeder guy, if you breed an excellent dog to an excellent dog, you can only hope for one excellent dog out of that litter. You're right. not going to get 10 excellent dogs. You're going to get one excellent one, maybe. And if you get that one excellent one, then supposedly you have a stud, you know. Right. And then it kind of goes down from there. But what you said, you really hit the nail on the head where, <clears throat> well, you know, when when I get the phone call and they say, oh, he bit this or he did this or whatever. And, you know, I just didn't socialize him properly. Or he was a rescue, which something we're also going to talk about. Right. Um, so, you know, he was abused or he was this or he was that, whatever. <clears throat> but they always chalk it up to socialization. And uh, the reality is, if, like, if, for, ex- for example, the dog I have here right now, Buddy, who's an interesting fellow, but a pretty nice dog. He's, he's very interesting. And if I would take him, if I would just do the prescribed method, which is, you know, go socialize your dog, he'd be dead by now. And somebody would be super hurt. Because he's the type of dog with the type of problem that <clears throat> um, he'll, he'll redirect like you were saying, the dog is so excited to see that other dog, whether it's whatever's in his mind, like I got to kill this dog or I got to play with this dog if he's so jacked to see him. When you try and stop this guy, he kind of goes after you. Right. And that's some scary stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that'll get him euthanized. Especially when you throw in the emotional charge then of a handler, pa- parent, you know, pet parent who is feeling compassion and, and anticipation and insecurity. Yeah. Just the cocktail that that creates. Or a competent dog handler like myself. Who goes well, and I'm takes, saying, if it's, if, it's, um, saying. if it's knocking you off center, imagine what it would do to somebody who, yeah. who you know, this dog is their child or their baby or, or their, their family member. Yeah. Um, and, again, why this dog is doing what he's doing is not something that you can ask him. Mm-hmm. Hardly it's ever something that you can ask a human. Sure. You know, Joe, you're really drinking a lot. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Because mm-hmm. it feels good and mm-hmm. just because I, I can't stop. Mm-hmm. You can't really ask. But at that point when you can't even ask the question, it's like all the world sees is actions. Mm. The world doesn't see the intentions behind the dog, nor can you ask the dog its intentions. Mm. And what you're seeing is this kind of volatile reaction that this dog is giving. And to say that it was or was not socialized, like... To that dog, that is perhaps what it means to be social. Yeah. Well, that's his idea of being social. That's his idea sure. of being yeah. social. Yeah. And why that happened is not because he wasn't socialized enough or he was over-socialized. It's because those are the fundamental boundaries and proper behaviors that this dog, for some reason, has in his mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
This is his idea in life. And the other thing is if you can't stop a dog mm -hmm. from doing something like this, it's they're essentially just reinforced. Especially if you try to stop the dog and you fail. I mean, the dog becomes reinforced in this feeling. And then, of course, you know, <clears throat> if you have this issue and then your solution is to go socialize and you keep having the same scenario happen over and over and mm -hmm. over again, it's it's doing you much more harm. Especially than when you try to positively reinforce moments during that. You can get very, very stuck with that and reinforce it in a lot of very inappropriate ways well that's a tricky thing because um when you get into positive reinforcement when dealing with social issues like that right because it's really hard to <clears throat> there you can use it in there when you achieve a certain state of mind or a certain behavior you can then switch over to your positive reinforcement but what i found happens is uh patterns you know in dogs mm -hmm. and a lot of dogs have figured out the patterns to things like I act like a this, like I was going to say a jerk, but maybe that's a little rude. But I act like a unsocial individual. How he thinks he should, yep. he or she thinks she should, which is inappropriate. Yep, yep. And they don't know it's inappropriate, but right. I act in this way. <clears throat> I turn around and look at you, and you give me a piece of food. I'm like, well, yeah, this is great. Sounds you know, awesome. It reminds me of a story I heard once that was really funny about a dog that was trained for food refusal, right? And not the way that we're training it, in mm -hmm. a different way. And the dog was basically like, almost in like an aggressive way, taught like, if you offer me food, I'm going to like go after you, right? Right. So the dog, this German Shepherd, I think, and the guy, they were doing the training and the guy went to offer the dog the bone and the dog was supposed to like avoid taking the bone from the hand of the guy and the dog bit the guy, hardcore, and then took the bone. <laughs> yeah. so it's kind of like, oh, this is the pattern. All right. Somebody yeah. comes and they try to do food, refusal, I'm going to bite you. And then and I'm going to just grabbing, take right. what I want. So it becomes this pattern. Yeah. And the dog is like, yeah, this works for me. This is yeah, cool. leave the gun, take the cannoli. <laughs> sounds, <laughs> so, you know, so, it sounds like a good deal to me. So, but yeah, if every time I said to someone, you know, F you, they handed me a cheeseburger, I'd be telling people sure. to go F themselves all the time. Well, it, it, and it ultimately it comes down to, uh, you know, with individuals, accountability is such a huge thing. And you know the other thing, I mean, socially... Just to, now I'm going to go off topic because I think we live I'll in this. You, I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds of off topic. <laughs> we live in a socially weird world mm -hmm. right now. I don't know if it's social media or what, but, you know, we we talk about politics a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to get into politics and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I will say, if there's anything I can say about the president we have, he has virtually no accountability at all. And he is the president. And it seems like now socially, the louder you are and the less you have to say, the more recognition that you're going to get. And people gravitate towards that more. They don't, and, and also, the more ridiculous your claims are or the more ridiculous the things you say. It seems like it, 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 it's just a very strange... So it, it's no wonder our dogs are so... You know? There is something you know, to be said because you know, being from New York, and I'm bringing it back now, you mm -hmm. know, yeah, thank when you. you go to Central thank Park you. in the morning... <laughs> Dogs act very differently. Their their place in society is very different than it is here. Mm. Uh, when I first applied for for my first rescue dog, they asked, "Will this be an indoor dog or an outdoor dog?" I when you were like, in New York? No, when I was here. When I moved here, okay. that's one of the first questions they asked. I'm like, "What the shit are you talking about? An indoor dog or an outdoor dog?" Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Like, there's such a thing as an outdoor dog, you know? Because well, like, yeah, here right. they would keep the dog outside right. all the exactly. time. Exactly, and this was a concept that was so unfamiliar to me. But but dogs act differently. Because their place in society is different. And what it means for a dog to be social here is different than what it means for a dog to be social there. Just like here, socially, you and I giving each other eye contact mm -hmm. is very different than me meeting with somebody of a different culture, mm. giving them eye contact, and perhaps really offending them. Sure. You have to learn. And the only way to learn is to be corrected, whether it's by a, hey, while you're here, don't do that, or you know, something more drastic. If you keep doing it, you keep doing it. They're like, what is your problem? Yeah. You're not figuring this out. And that's how we have to react and, and interact with our dogs because dogs by nature with, I'm sure the exception of a few that you've come across, don't do things to be malicious. Yeah. They don't do things because they genuinely want to be mean. With except, I did say with exception, <laughs> I did say with exception. Yeah. But a dog doesn't attack another dog, for the most part, with exception, because it loves to hurt another oh, dog. No, no. And the reason that they do it is because it exists acceptedly within their, their boundaries of society mm -hmm. and their social structure. Humans, kind of coming back to what you were just mentioning, 
our social, uh, our socialization with each other has gotten so complicated because you and I can talk and I can make friends in Norway without ever having met them, seen them, talked to them. But we both click the same like on the same Dragon Ball Z picture and now we're best buds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if that's a good thing or a bad thing for, for society or for social interaction is up to each individual to decide. I think it's horrible mm-hmm. um, that, that we're losing this face to face. But, you know, when it comes to dogs, being social doesn't mean what you think it means. Yeah, that is my main slogan of the day. Yeah. Um, and that I want my dog to be social with me, mm-hmm. and Inter- that's it. Interactive with you. Interactive with yeah. me, and have me be the basis of his or her experiences, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's it. Mm-hmm. And if it wants to have an experience, I want to okay that. I want to be the the, the king of the castle mm-hmm. to my dog, because what what you mentioned that I think is so important to take away is that experience doesn't have to mean interaction yeah and that having one and not the other they're not mutually exclusive Mm -hmm. i don't have to interact to have the experience and i don't have but i but i can have the experience if i don't interact which is one of the main i don't want to say arguments but one of the main disagreements with kind of your foundation which is you can experience it, but you can't interact with it. Well, how am I supposed to form experiences if I can't engage? Mm-hmm. You can form experiences without interacting. Through observation. Through observation, through sensory perception. Mm-hmm. Humans are so... We are, we're visually kind of interpretive creatures, but with our complex language, we're interaction-based. Mm-hmm. That if me and you walk up to each other on the street, we don't look at each other, we don't say anything to each other, that's an experience. Mm-hmm. We don't think it is because we didn't speak and we didn't make eye contact. But we're not picking up on everything else. The mm-hmm. smells, the energy that dogs do. Mm-hmm. It's an experience for humans and dogs alike. But humans, the human experience is trumped by the eyes and by the by by speech. By our ways of interacting with each other. Our main ways of These interacting with each other. These are the things we're looking other. for. Right. Whereas a dog is looking for things that are much more subtle. Right, and I've had we a, can't see. I've had it plenty of times at the gym where I I won't look at somebody and I won't talk to them, but I, holy, holy smacks, do they smell? <laughs> and the next time I see them, I'll remember yeah. that we had that interaction. Yeah. yeah. Right, but yeah. dogs are everybody are, right now is back thinking of people they knew that stunk, or, or was, people that you've never interacted with that you have had experiences with, mm-hmm. and that's the main thing that I'm trying to draw out because when you say you know, I want my dog to be neutral and not engage and not interact. People are going to say, well, how's it supposed to gain experience then? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just like that, mm-hmm. without interacting, without, without interacting. engaging. Those are experiences for the dog mm-hmm. with boundaries. Mm-hmm. If you experience without boundaries, then you have interaction. Then you have engagement. Then you have an all-you-can-eat buffet of whatever yeah. you want to do. Yeah. And that's why I think a lot of problems that you see behaviorally with dogs come from a dog seeing something. And reacting to it, which is very unnatural for a dog because dogs are not visually perceptive. Visual is not their main form of interpretation. True. True. Yep. My dog doesn't like men. Yeah. My dog doesn't like black people. Yeah. My dog doesn't, li- you know, which there is some science behind, um, especially yeah, the, but the it, black thing. In my experience, I've never seen any of that to be true. Exactly. Like, because the people come here and they say, oh, my dog doesn't like men. And they say, well, then you're having a lesson with me. Exactly. And the dog's fine with me in five minutes. And that is exactly what I'm saying. Because when people say that their dog is perceiving potential social issues based on what it's visually observing, mm-hmm. it is unnatural. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is not supposed to be because dogs are olfactory perceivers. The other thing that people aren't considering to, is that is what is dogs natural what are dogs natural social behaviors which is if you take <clears throat> so they're a part of a pack they are mm-hmm. social within their mm-hmm. pack and within that pack there's a, a hierarchy and there's ranking systems and stuff and I'm sure that fluctuates from here to there but or here and there but the interesting thing is if you take that pack and that pack sees another pack they're not going to go and like you know, have a have a dance. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like go and like play around and cool. All right, we'll see you guys later. We'll catch you next week. Yeah. They don't. They look at that and they go, "That's a threat." Like this is a threat to my existence in some way or another. And I and, and a dog's number one and all of our number one, we've all got motivators, right? We've got drives, drives, 
And our number one motivator, all the drives fall into one drive, I think, self-preservation. Survival. Yep, survival. So that's a dog's number one mm -hmm. motivator. And if you take, I, it's, it's my opinion from just the little bit of wolf research that I've done, if you take two lone wolves, right, that are out on their own and they see each other, they are not going to mingle. They're not going to sniff butts. They're not going to fight. That's the other thing that's interesting is whenever I, I like to ask people questions and get their ideas. And I ask, what do you think two wolves would do if they meet each other and there's no pack and there's no kill and there's no babies, there's no puppies. It's just two lone wolves, no territory. And everybody says, oh, they're going to fight. And they're like, no, they're not going to fight. Because they're like, this, this is, what is the point of fighting right now? That's why a very interesting thing we'll talk about drives at some point is fight drive which a lot of people refer to, especially when you get into like the tough dogs. The mm -hmm. dogs got tons of fight drive. Fight drive is non-existent on its own. Fight drive must be accompanied by something else. So whether it's territory or, you know, whatever, uh, that's where you're going to see it. So these two wolves, they won't fight. They give each other space and they go on their way. Which comes back to kind of there's no inherently malicious dog. Yeah. Because fighting for the sake of fighting is a pay-per-view movie. It yeah. is not real life. If there's no. food involved, if there is, you know, no, we, sex involved, if there's reprodu reproduction involved, then there's something worth fighting for. Fighting is not the drive. Fighting is the means to achieve what the drive is uh, is aiming to obtain. Quick little side note on that, though, as well, is if you take a certain breed of dog that's like terrier and bulldog, which has been genetically right. modified, you could say, engineered, you know, bred mm -hmm. to have more of this combative nature to them. Uh, it doesn't mean, like you said, the fight drive is, is non-existent on its own. But dogs who fight can enjoy fighting. And, and then they there, can seek it and then they can... And then there's, there's a good deal of nurture that goes into priming a dog to be able to fight, including bait dogs and including starvation and punishment and abuse mm -hmm. and things like that that, but that I've, definitely... I, I've also seen here, though... Because back in the day, we there had some pretty, to all, all, we had some pretty it's tough It's not a rule dogs. if there aren't exceptions yeah, to it. You but know? I've seen enough of, enough of these strong type, dominant type dogs that had never been nurtured into fighting each other. Never. Ever. And once they fight, it's, it doesn't matter how old they are. Once they fight, it's a done deal, man. They're looking for it. They want it. And, and I don't know. I can't tell you why they want it or if they really actually like it. But it's like drugs to them. You know and, I mean? and and there's a lot of and I, I don't want to get too off topic, but there's there's a lot of there's a lack of substantial research about how a dog processes memories that would indicate that if two dogs are in amidst a fight and you separate them, that dogs don't see in terms of like this the, the typical memory, but rather like a chapter book. Hmm. And so now they're in the moment on chapter five, kibbles and oats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as soon as they see a dog that reminds them of chapter three, that chapter three didn't end, but chapter three was abruptly stopped and stepped and separated because they were pulled apart, it'll resume right where it left off. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So, so you know, when you see two dogs fighting, to separate them and immediately remove them from proximity is almost guarantee that as soon as they re-pick up where they, where they left off, Without any rhyme or reason, they will re-engage, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, I don't recommend if, if three or four dogs are fighting that you jump in there and separate them necessarily, depending on the circumstances. Well, yeah, I saw it happen at the dog park. Yeah. Somebody and got was, bit? Holy, my, holy shit, he's punching his dog in the face. It was a whole mess. Um, but you separate them to the, so that they're safe, but you don't immediately remove them from each other's proximity. Mm -hmm. And you let them kind of simmer down so that that chapter can end with... Something else. This is done. Well, the thing, and we'll, we're eventually going to cover this <clears throat> general idea, mm -hmm. which is dogs being here and now. We're going to cover it more in a training perspective of yeah. how to create drive and create ideas and retain memory and stuff like that, retain memories or retain the information. Uh, but what, what you're essentially talking about is if your dog is, because the dog is here and now, if mm -hmm. you take them from a certain experience, feeling a certain way, and you isolate them from that experience they will retain the same feeling they had leaving that experience right. the next time they encounter a similar experience. And, right. And a, a very kind of more approachable way to think about that that everybody deals with is I'm taking Fluffers out for a walk, and as soon as I grab the leash, he's, er, un, he's bouncing off the walls. If I begin that chapter with that state of mind, 
that state of mind will dictate that chapter. Sure. So if I have a dog that has excitement on leash, if I wait until Fluffers is calm before leaving, Mm -hmm. there's a much higher likelihood for success that he will retain that calm demeanor throughout that. Just like if I get in a car and I'm amped up the whole drive, I'm going to be way more likely to get an amp, to be amped up my whole day. For, you know, that's why people meditate in the morning. And that's why people may make their bed I in can, the morning. They can start see work out in the morning. Yeah. Right. To start that on kind of a more peaceful note. Because especially with dogs that do kind of sequentially experience mm-hmm. the here and now, that... If you begin a chapter in a certain state of mind, that state of mind will dictate the chapter. It could carry on. Just like carry over. if you end a chapter with a certain state of mind, if similar things bring back that experience, it will pick up right where it left off. So mm-hmm. that doesn't have to do too much with socialization, but it is an important thing to consider when you're talking about having all the chips in your favor mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for creating a dog that is socially appropriate mm-hmm. that if i am getting ready to take fluffer nutter on a walk and he's going absolutely crazy the likelihood that he will act socially appropriate on that walk might not be to my advantage mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and maybe i want to do a couple things to tweak his experience mm-hmm. the one thing i was going to say uh, in light of what you said before that's interesting is that in the case of where you like you have a dog who's wants is excited to go for the walk and you instead wait it out until he's calm. Mm-hmm. If you do that three days in a row, he'll be calm right away to go for the walk. But when he goes on the walk, he'll be excited again. That and the, feeling won't. And of course, these over. are absolutely circumstantial to totally. the dog. Totally. And you know, it, for the people that tell me my dog has no manners, he jumps on everything. It's like, well, you're giving your dog everything without asking for something. Yeah. And you got to ask for something because in the dog world, you shouldn't get something for nothing. Mm-hmm. And Fluffernutter is so excited to go on this walk and you're giving it to him. You're rewarding him for being in that state of mind. Mm-hmm. And and that's where kind of that recommendation, at least for me, comes from when I'm talking to, to mm-hmm. people and just what's, they're having what's, a slew of issues. I don't want to get too off topic no, of kind no, of social yeah, and yeah, being we social. we got to save that. We'll um, save that because that is another thing and we can talk about specifically how to try to kind of shape the dog's mind so that you can... Uh, manipulate keep, right. keep that feeling throughout the walk right which has to be done through training right and right. proofing and experiencing yeah. but not interacting no no not interacting. experiencing no no and, but, and so i guess my my main takeaway for today's episode is that being social exists on a huge spectrum for people mm-hmm. that it for some reason has become misinterpreted and oversimplified for dogs mm-hmm. that there is not a spectrum of being social for dogs, but a dog being social is one thing and one thing only, mm-hmm. which is exuberant and outgoing and loves everybody and loves to be pet and he's the funnest and oh my gosh. And no, mm-hmm. there is a huge spectrum for people about being social and it's the same for dogs. There's a huge spectrum. And if somebody said to me, Alex, I know you're really uncomfortable in huge groups of strangers, but I'm putting a leash around your neck and I'm dragging you to this party. Mm-hmm. And you're going to talk to everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you expect me to do? I'd be or like, you're, Holy shit. or you're not comfortable with kids because you don't have any kids, and I haven't yeah. seen any kids. And now you're going to sit here, and I'm going to make you sit here while this kid comes up and pets you. And I'm going to do it ten times, and if eventually on the tenth time you don't like it, I'll give you a Xanax before. Yeah. And then I'll sit there, yeah. you know, drooling out of my mouth, and that's a whole other. The thing kids too, will love is, me. Is so a lot of times yeah. people will have these social issues where they just where they just didn't it just didn't work out right, mm-hmm. and the dog's probably fine. And the, they go to the vet. The vet says, well, you know, put them on Prozac. Medicate the dog. Yeah. Which is really... That's so messed up, man. They did that to my dog. Which one? The Hudson? Not Batman. No, that Hudson. Was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> they did it to Hudson? They wanted They tried? To... Yeah. Yeah. They tried with me, too, as a human. Irina said something really poignant, which was, you cannot work with a dog whose mind is not whole. You know no. what I mean? Yeah. And, and when their mind is altered like that, that is not a solution. And I would advise, even at the risk of not knowing anything about any of the situations any of you guys are in, I would advise not doing any type of... No, there's rescue remedy, and there's some cool herbal things. Holistic that can kind things. Of help. Uh, Thunder know, vest, stuff like that. Thunder shirt Which or works maybe like 1% of the time, I think yeah. they've proven. But yeah. a, a behavioral veterinarian is really... 
Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. either be one or the other, bro. Like, I'll have one know. on the show next week with this. Will you really? <laughs> no, I'll oh, have to I, get you one know, now. Because I'll shit on him. Yeah, I'll have or her. one now. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's just, I, I think that kind of, you know, it's it's very similar to kids in ADHD medication, for example, where, you know, utilizing both, one in the short term and then one for long term. Medication has been shown to have no long term benefit mm-hmm. for kids or for adults that are suffering from ADHD symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, do they work immediately? Yes. Is there mm-hmm. a certain kind of validation that comes with that? Yes. If your landlord is yelling at you because your dog barks all night and this and this and this, is it easier to put them on medication than it is to tweak your lifestyle a little bit? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's why such a grossly large percentage of Americans are on diabetes and, and heart pressure medication is mm-hmm. because they don't want to spend an hour of their day exercising and being more physically fit and changing their diet. Changing their diet. Everybody wants a pill. That's yep. for a whole other show that yeah. I could go on and on about. Just but socialization, medi- it's this, but it is socialization. It's the same thing. My dog is unsocial, so let's medicate him. Yeah. But it's not nobody, or not nobody, but it seems like some people are not interested in diving, you know, solving the big picture, looking at the big picture. Mm-hmm. They want your dog quick, quick is tricks. who your dog is. Yeah, I mean, you just with but with time and consideration mm-hmm. and work and all this kind of stuff, you can you can manage this stuff to make it. I mean, in most there's always some extreme cases where it's not doable, but in most cases it's totally doable. But people uh, it seems like people are just they want to find something quick or like well, I mean, in electric collars, which we're going to talk about at one point, it's like you know. Electric collars are becoming so commonplace, and then some people think, "Oh, my dog's like this," and I'm going to put electric collar on him and give him some juice when he acts up. The dog goes through the roof yeah. because that's what electric collars do when you're in a heightened state of mind. Mm-hmm. People don't know that, so it's like, you know, takeaway from today is social. If you look, one more thing, I'm going to have to say for the takeaway today. My social opinion is: I don't have to try in your hat. Mm-hmm. I don't drive your car. I don't have mm-hmm. to drive your car. I don't have to hold your baby. I don't ask to play your guitar. This is all your stuff. I've mentioned this a gazillion times. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is truly socially appropriate. And when somebody comes up and asks me if they can pet my dog, I'm offended. I'm like, no, I didn't bring him here so you can pet him. I brought him here so I can enjoy the day with my dog. Like I go with my girlfriend, man. I'm going to hang out. If somebody comes up and goes, wow, she's hot. Can I hug her? Like no, dude, you can't hug my girlfriend. But seriously, I'm I'm a girlfriend guy. I'm really good with girlfriends. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's like that they get the shit out of here, dude. That's what people said to me. It's like seriously, dogs love me. Yeah, they really love Could me. Could you imagine though that that's such a beautiful analogy? Could yeah. you imagine if somebody said, "No, I'm a I'm a girlfriend, I'm a girlfriend, guy, girlfriend guy, man. Girlfriend guy, man. Girls girlfriends love me." Love me. <laughs> yeah, that one I haven't heard, and that's quite brilliant. That really, uh, I I really like that. <laughs> um, but that's the scoop. Um, yeah. So. Just something for everybody to think about. And it is a, a topic that is beyond complex and yeah. will, you know... We'll be jumping back Your mileage forth. will vary. Yeah, and we'll be jumping back and forth into this as mm-hmm. things go on because um, the social aspect to life is everything, man. I mean, if your dog is not able to... If you're training and your dog doesn't have a good idea socially, you're going to have a very difficult time training in new and strange places. Mm-hmm. You know, If you're not training, you just want to hang, which most of us want to do 90% of the time. Obviously, you're going to struggle there. So. And it's like, you know, I, I have been at yep. extremely high drive. Yep. I like playing video games. Yeah. While I'm playing video games, he's laying down next to me. Yeah. So he's and adapted. Your yeah. dog is very special, though. I know. He's, he's different. different. He's different. But, uh, you know, the main thing, again, is you don't have to interact Thank to you. form a bank of experiences. That's right. So that, That's a beautiful way to put yeah. it. Thank you. Cool. One more thing. Movie. What are we talking about this week? Uh, Isle of Dogs? No, man. I, no, I, I'm look. When we're talking about movies, you guys, we're talking about like some not cartoons, but oh. like some some movie that involves some animal that's got some cool animal training, and it doesn't have to be oh. dog specific. And by the way, everybody, thanks so much for watching. And if there's anything you guys want us to talk about, uh, just go ahead and comment, like, subscribe, comment, all that kind of stuff, and mm-hmm. let us know, and we'd love to cover it for you. Uh, if there's any movies you suggest, any great movies with animals, I'd and love I to watch. see them. I yeah. watch, I watch them all because I'm into animal training, and I think uh, I watch seeing that stuff is all great. Should have said, but <clears throat> I don't. I, I understand the concept of a movie, though, you know, and that it's just a movie. So. And talking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the movie I want to talk about is my second favorite dog movie this week from 1985 or 86, called The Journey of Natty Gam, which is. Uh, got my favorite, the the dog that got me wanting a dog, and his name was Jed, and he was a wolf dog. He was half uh, 
Alaskan Malamute, half Siberian Husky, or half wolf, sorry, not Siberian Husky, Malamute and wolf. And he only had one handler. And I'm going to, and if I do my digging and do my stuff right, I'm going to find this guy and I'm going to ask him some questions because this guy also sure trained, uh, trained. Uh, oh, he trained all of them. Well, the, he trained like a shitload of dogs. He trained a bunch of dogs. He trained the Turner and Hooch dogs and yeah. he trained some other, he, he worked with other animals too. But this Jed the Wolf dog was in White Fang, if you guys remember this from 91. Right, right, right. He was in It from 82. He was in Natty Gann in like 85, 86. And he was in, I think, Return of White Fang. So the dog was born in 1977, and he died in 1991. No, that's not right. He was born in 1970. He was 18 years old when he died. He was, uh, when he did this Natty Gann thing, he was about 10 years old. Hmm. And it's some real training, man. And I it, never saw a dime of that money. It's either. like, the guy? Or the dog. Well, the dog, no, I doubt it. But I'm sure he had a great life, man. He's a big mother. Nobody yeah. could touch him. From what I read, he was extremely unsocial. He could be handled by his one handler. But he the... probably wasn't well socialized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Anyway, um, the, the thing about the dog that's... I was talking to Dave Curry about it some time ago. The thing about the dog that's so cool is now when you go and you see like movies, there's a lot of like clever overdubs and there's mm-hmm. like you know some cool cinematography so they make it look a lot more than it is or like a lot of quick shots you know this dog was for real like they've got some it's not pretty man some of it's some straight defense work in there where the dog is like gonna take somebody out and there's like these dog simulated dog fights that look like dog fights they don't it doesn't look like two dogs playing at all it's like some rough stuff. And back in the day, before they had all this stuff, they, they were not fair to animals, and they and animals did get hurt, and that's why they started changing things mm-hmm. because of this stuff. But uh, this dog is a real... He's really special. What's the movie called again? The Journey of Natty Gan. And it's a uh-huh. great movie. It's well, a, we'll watch it. Yeah, I hope so, you guys. And just check out the dog, and check out the things that this dog is doing, from the running and the jumping and the, the, the fighting to the protection work. And, like, straight real aggression. I mean, like, to the core aggression, which I'm not into, but I can always respect Mm -hmm. from a safe distance. Yeah. Right? From the other side of the screen. From the other side of the six-inch glass when I go to the zoo. (laughs) Anyway, you guys, The Journey of Natty Gam. That's the movie I want you to see this week. Um, We'll be back again real soon. Mm -hmm. Don't know what we're going to talk about, but we wanted to start at at the base and kind of build up. So socialization is really everything. So, um... Take it with a grain of salt. Give it a shot at home. Keeping your dog neutral. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll be back talking about um, select, selecting puppies, most likely. Yeah. Alex, you've rescued a dog. I want to ask you some questions Did about that. that. And I've, selected a puppy. Yeah, I've never. I've bought puppies, but never rescued a dog. And yeah. I think... Rescuing dogs is fantastic. Yeah, as long kitties as you... this weekend, too. Yeah, you did. Tell us about that real quick. No, we don't have time for that. No, yeah, we do. Go for it. They called me and they said, can you bring two two-day-old kittens, five of them, four of them, out to Monticello. Where were they? They were in St. Paul. So, I, you know, not too Somebody far found me. them? Uh, they were already at the Humane Society. Oh. And I get there and they say, I'm here to pick up four kittens. And they say, we only got five kittens. And I say, all right, I'll take them all. <laughs> they say, oh, dude. Tiny, I saw them in your oh, hands. Oh, my gosh. You're on uh, Instagram at uh, Amos. Yeah, A-M-A-A-S K9. A-M-A-A-S K9 on Instagram. Mostly pictures of my dogs. That's cool. That's what people yeah. want to see. So you guys so. can go check them out. And he's got pictures of uh, these little tiny kids. Oh, my God. Videos and stuff. They it's look ridiculous. like baby gerbils. Oh, they're so Oh, cute. they just, you put them together. You, you separate them and they just pop, repile together. Really? It's unbe- oh, my gosh. Really? Oh, as soon as you move one, it starts like mewing. And then you put it down, because we had to transport them from one container. Yeah. Immediately just come back together and pile up for warmth. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And comfort. Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful comfort. life. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Good for you, man. Yeah. Thanks so, for doing that. We'll see you all soon. All right, cool. Later. That's my dog. Body that I'd rather share my dialogue.